Okay, welcome. Can everybody hear me? All right. Um, today's topic is uh, AWS Lambda coding, best practices and com common mistakes. Uh, my name is Derek Ashmore. Um, basically, I've been doing uh, Lambdas uh, off and on for several years now, um, since, it, uh, since it first came out. Um, I run these things a little bit differently. I run these presentations as discussions, all right? It doesn't do you any good for me to drone on for 45 minutes and not be able to ask questions. So I can take a limited number of questions during the presentation and I'll hang around at the end as well, okay? Um, and in fact, I'm gonna start out by asking you to participate. Show of hands, who has physically coded a lambda? Okay, say about 60%. All right, let's expand the world a little bit. Who, ha who is working on a team that actively maintains Lambda and you are in relatively close proximity? Okay, a few more hands came up. All right, um, if you didn't raise your hand, don't worry, I'll give you a boost. There are a couple of slides where I'll tell you what Lambda is, what the primary benefits are, and basically give you the, uh, the nickel tour. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I'm a professional geek. Uh, I started in this business in 1987, which puts me uh, at old, but not quite ancient and decrepit. Um, basically, I've got a wide variety of experience. Spent a couple decades in the Java space before moving on to cloud, circa 2010. I've been doing a lot of cloud work, a lot of moving applications to the cloud, a lot of refactoring applications so they can better take uh, advantage of cloud capabilities. Um, and my most common interview question is, yes, I still do code. In fact, I prefer to do that. Um, nobody pays me to just do that anymore. So um, I have some percentage of white shirt stuff that I have to deal with. Um, I also don't need much sleep. So instead of uh, streaming Netflix at night or whatnot, I write blog articles and books and do geek things. So that's enough about me. Let's talk about discussion resources. This presentation deck is on my slide share. If I, I go to these uh, presentations, I see people taking pictures of different slides. This is the only one you need for that top link. All right. Everything else in this presentation is on that slide share. I use active links liberally. So you don't need to record URLs or anything along those lines. All my samples basically come from my GitHub. Okay. Um, let's level set on the agenda. First, I give a couple slides and only a couple that um, will help boost the people who haven't coded a Lambda so they understand what we're talking about and we're all on the same page. Um, then we're going to go into some coding level tips, some higher level tips uh, as far as support and uh, operational kind of habits that we've fallen into, when to use Lambdas, and then we'll do some summary and Q&A. Everything I'm telling you today comes from the field. At different points in my career, I've managed teams that support large numbers of Lambdas. And everything I'm suggesting you adopt, every best practice, every common mistake I'm going to tell you about, comes from the field. Every common mistake I've seen made, or I won't admit to it, but sometimes made them myself. So <laughs> anyway, all right, what are lambdas? Uh, basically, AWS is AWS Lambda is a service by which you provide code and the man behind the curtains finds some place to run it. The man behind the curtain deals with hardware. The man behind the curtain deals with software upgrades. The man behind the curtain deals with dynamic scaling. So if your Lambda needs to scale up at any time, the man behind the curtain has um, provisions to do that within reason. Um, 
The man behind the curtain maintains hardware and all updates. Lambdas are event driven and there are a whole wide range of events that you can use. Um, one of the most popular is the API gateway where you could make a Lambda kind of publish it as a REST service or something along those lines if you wanted to. Um, and there are many more events that can invoke a Lambda. You can directly invoke a Lambda. Um, you could schedule them. You can um, have them um, spawned by message events or other types of events. Um, at any rate, Lambdas are truly stateless, or they're designed to be stateless. That is, when we code applications, sometimes we'll We'll store things in memory that are like frequent data lookups, things along those lines. That's really kind of an anti-pattern in a lambda. It really counts on you to be stateless. There are some kludge workarounds around that, one of which I'll tell you about later. Um, but basically, they're stateless, or supposed to be stateless. Um, and for the Java geeks in the room, I am not referring to Java 8 lambda expressions. That's the same label used for a different, um, different construct altogether. And as a further boost to all those people who didn't raise a hand, essentially the key part of publishing a Lambda, other than just packaging it and handing it to um, AWS, is you have to write a handler. And to give you an idea, in other words, for the Java geeks in the room, you're implementing an interface. For other geeks in the room, um, essentially you need to run, a handler is something that takes an event and takes a context. The event has any parameters, input parameters, that your, um, that your Lambda needs. For instance, if you're using it to publish a REST API and you get a JSON document at, as input, um, AWS will parse that out in the various, uh, in the various uh, languages and give that to you as an event. And all those parameters are part of that event. Context is basically your runtime context. Um, it tells you different things about the account it's running in and um, if you're using Cognito, um, what you're coming in as from like say a mobile device or something along those lines. Um, but essentially you provide a handler it does your work in the same way that you're used to coding it in the wide variety of languages Lambda supports, and there you go. Now, before I go on, anybody have any questions? Those people who didn't raise their hands have any? Okay. All right. I'm going to launch right into it. The airplane's going to dive from 5,000 feet down to ground level. All right? But let's level set first. What, in my view, is a best practice? Uh, best practice, for me, is something that makes support easier. It always boggles my mind. Everybody, with every paradigm we come up with, everybody concentrates on the initial development cost and how quickly can you turn something new out there. Um, my experience is code is supported much more than it's written the first time. We spend more time and effort supporting it and modifying it and changing it than we spend initially writing it. So support is um, priority one in my mind. Um, along with that goes increased reuse so I don't have to write as much code. Uh, basically increases performance. Obviously we want things to run quickly and fast and cheaply with um, few resources and minimize resource consumption. And to hit the first point a second time, labor in terms of support, in my mind, that that's a resource. So um, that's the things I think about when I consider a best practice. And let's get on, um, get on to some of these. Um, some of these are just dog simple. I go for high value low impact kinds of things. And one of them is to basically wrap the body of the uh, work that the Lambda does in a global try catch. Um, and let me explain that. 
If you don't do that and a lambda errors out, you will get a stack trace in um, CloudWatch. All right, so you will get the error and you will get the stack that your development language um, basically um, forwards on to you, a Java stack trace or a Python trace or whatever else that, uh, whatever else that you get. Um, but what you don't get necessarily by default is the inputs that went into the Lambda to make it blow up. And from a support perspective, that saves you a lot of time. And this example is Python, but the same concept holds for Node.js, C Sharp, all the other languages that Lambda support. Um, basically, if I get an exception, I throw the event out there in the logs too, so that I get all the inputs. Okay? Notice the hyperlinks. If you pull this down off my slide share, these go to uh, links on my GitHub, and you can check them out in their detailed glory. Sure. Rays. Um, I've caught the exception. The Lambda runtime engine doesn't know about it. If I don't raise it, then AWS doesn't know it's an error. All right? It's kind of like, if I didn't have the raise, I'd effectively be swallowing the exception. Okay? Anything else? Okay. Checking arguments up front. Who all, interactivity again, who all has had the pleasure of trying to diagnose a low-level exception, like a null pointer exception, or something that comes from really low level that, okay, a lot of people here. All right, that's a pain, isn't it? Now, um, I get something like that on my team. To me, we've got two problems. One is you have to fix whatever blew it up. But the second thing is we have to report it properly. Looking at support labor again, is it easier to solve one of those null pointer exceptions or something with a clear error message that says, hey, the assumed role is not provided as an argument, right? It seems simple. A lot of developers don't do this because they're rushed, right? But this su saves support time. And it's easy, it's not rocket science, right? Once again, examples in my GitHub. Now, uh, for those of you that publish lambdas, how often has anybody ever had the problem where a lambda doesn't work quite right, you need to enhance it, and you have no idea where the source repo for that lambda is? I see a gentleman, a couple people raising their hands. We've experienced that too. So we've got another simple solution that increases the likelihood that somebody follows the SDLC process is that at a, as a comment to all my lambdas that I publish, basically I just put the source repo on top so that somebody knows where, where to go and where to change it. So what happens if you don't do that, you'll get slightly different copies in all your different accounts, and that's a pain too. All right. Um, this is more architectural. Lambda is an AWS proprietary kind of construct, all right? I know four different CTOs that have mandated dual cloud solutions, right? Anything I write with that proprietary interface can't go to Azure easily or can't go uh, to Google Cloud or any of the other vendors. So what I've done is I've basically look at Lambda as a publishing mechanism, and I write the business logic that the Lambda is going to execute separately, and the part of my deployment that's Lambda specific just wraps the interface along with the try catch, the global try catch that we talked about. So separation of concerns. Your Lambda basically picks up your arguments, picks up anything in the environment configuration, marshals error in a global fashion. But other than that, 
calls out to your business logic that doesn't know anything about Lambda. All right? So um, basically it makes it easier to locally debug and locally test. Now, any questions about, yes, sir? So where's your business logic? OK, when you, it differs slightly uh, depending upon which development language you use. But when you hand your Lambda to AWS to run, you basically give it a zip file. And that zip file can have your dependencies. So for instance, this is a Python example. If you can't tell, I do more Python these days than anything else. But anyway, um, this is a Python example. Basically, execute, stop, start is imported up above the snippet. And it, it is included in the zip that got sent up to AWS. Yes. Yes, you'll have to, you'll, you'll have to declare the imports. In the case of Python, Python will automatically um, make any libraries that you put in that zip basically accessible for import, right? You just have to package them with your zip. But yes, that'll, 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 that'll happen. Um, OK, moving on. Who deploys lambdas manually by show of hands? Some people do. I run into a lot of that because it's quick and easy. It's easy to just go into the council, open up, create a new lambda, copy paste some code in there. Um, in this day and age, everything's automated. Lambda deployments should be too. Um, and basically, um, what I've sketched out here in the flowchart is basically a simple a uh, simplified type of uh, Lambda deployment that basically relies on an artifactory and builds the Lambda, deploys the Lambda, and runs a smoke test on the Lambda. And just like any other application code that we use, we should do something along those lines. OK. I've seen this. This is tale from the field. Um, basically, somebody will create a useful Lambda. That's a general purpose type Lambda. And they'll basically deploy it on every AWS account that they have. So I've got a insurance client. I had an insurance client last year that had 70 some AWS accounts. And those utility type Lambdas, there were 70 kind of 70 copies of those, one per one per account. And that gives you a problem because then you have, if you want to change that Lambda, you basically need to deploy it 70 times. And you can automate that, but I think that's solving the wrong problem. With just a few lines, and I mean less than a handful, you can basically install one copy of a Lambda and have it, through cross-account roles, do work in all those other 70 accounts. All right, so you only have one deployment to manage. And if you need to change it, it gets changed in one place. It's scalable. As you add accounts, you just add it to the, that Lambda's configuration of which accounts to look at, which roles to look at, and you go. Um, usually, I use DynamoDB as a place for configuration for those central type Lambdas. But the, the sky is the limit. You're not, you can use other things. Cross-account execution, it involves basically the STS service. You assume a role using STS, and what you get back is temporary credentials that work in that remote account. And then you can use those to do whatever work you need to do. And yes, there's a, uh, yes, there's a uh, link on my GitHub. All right. Lambdas, it used to be five, but lambdas are currently limited to a 15-minute runtime. Um, if you need to do work that's longer than that, typically what you'll do is you'll break it up into discrete units and invoke asynchronously, invoke other lambdas um, to do that. 
Um, there are limitations with this. Um, currently, by default, um, you only can support 1,000 executions, concurrent executions of a Lambda in an account. But I understand somebody made me aware a couple weeks ago that that's now a soft limit. I'm not sure what the hard limit is, but uh, you have to be aware of what your limits are there. And yes, there's a sample in my GitHub to be able to do that if you want to look at code. Now, people can go crazy with lambdas calling lambdas. I've seen one client went absolutely crazy with it, and they had all sorts of problems because they couldn't easily replicate a, a call scenario that eventually like blew up. All right, and that started to take a lot of support time. So artificially, and this is a subjective, artificial kind of limit. I restrict myself to one lambda invoking a lambda, one level of that. I don't do anything more than that. If I need to do more, I utilize AWS step functions, which provides better capabilities to be able to handle that kind of thing. Step functions basically operates on a state machine type model. And essentially, the nice thing it'll do from a support perspective is it'll allow you to collate um, a number of different lambdas that handle um, different states of that state machine and basically will give you log output that correlates all those lambda invocations. So you can see for an entire transaction described by the state machine, you can see um, logs that pertain to it, which makes it easier to support if you run into an error or a problem. Um, State machine, you might not have heard that since college. Um, I use turnstile as an example. It's either locked, you can go through it, or, uh, or it's locked, you can't go through it, you gotta issue payment, or it's unlocked, in which case you've done a payment and you can go through a turnstile like on a train on the L or something like that, for instance. Um, okay, another tale from the field. Uh, corporate requirement, enterprise edict, all logs, AWS application logs, need to go to Splunk. And so they distribute a nice instruction sheet. They give me the source code for the Lambda, and they say, you have to go in and change the Lambda to put in a 64-bit encoded uh, credential for Splunk and the channel that you're going to post to. And my question is, why are we doing that? Somebody should do that once. Those two inputs should be parameters or configuration to the lambda. And we shouldn't have to have slightly changed versions of that lambda for every account that we have and every application that we have. All right. Um, you can provide, when you install lambda, you can provide um, environment variables for configuration. Um, Another one of my pet peeves is basically unencrypted secrets, either in that configuration or in Git or something along those lines. We've all seen that, right? Um, don't do it. Providing secrets to lambdas. Um, use a digital vault. Um, I'm pretty... I'm pretty um, Vendor agnostic, whether you like CyberArk or HashiCorp Vault or whatever you like. Um, but in this day and age, don't, um, don't um, basically bury secrets in uh, Git or in your uh, Lambda um, configuration. Um, and in fact, this gets at another problem. I tend to prefer in an AWS world, I tend to prefer AWS Secrets Manager, and I'm not affi affiliated with Amazon. I'm not trying to sell stuff. But Secrets Manager solves a problem. You don't need a secret to get a secret. Okay, with Secrets Manager, I can define a role for a Lambda that says, hey, you have access to credential development FRED database credential, or whatever it is that I label it, right? And that comes from an IAM role, and only that Lambda can get to it in an administrator. 
all right? And that's, that Lambda does not have to have an encrypted secret to log into the digital vault to get the credential. That's a little bit subtle, but um, that's a great advantage. Um, any other digital vault essentially kicks the can to some degree because then you have to rig up some way for that Lambda to get the credential it needs to log in to the digital vault to get the credential it actually needs to do work. All right, common mistakes. I'm dealing with one of those right now. Um, I've got a client that took a JBoss deployed application and just decided it should be a Lambda. And honest to God, it takes seven minutes to come up. All right, and red, uh, it shouldn't be a lambda in its current form. All right, um, that completely, that completely boycotts what I told you about lambdas want to be state, stateless. It, um, and in fact, they need to use a kludge, which I'll tell you about because people use it, but it's really a kludge and it really walks around a bit. It's, I consider it an anti-pattern. Um, this lambda takes so long to come up they have a warmer. So every two minutes, they'll go out and they'll put an innocuous transaction to this Lambda to kind of twist the man behind the curtain's arm to not shut it down and leave it active all the time. <laughs> OK, so don't do that. Um, general rule of thumb, heavy footprint dependencies, you don't want them. Um, include what you need. I'm not trying to suggest that. Um, you code everything just to avoid including a library as a lambda, but be judicious about which dependencies um, you import because those dependencies will be, be loaded and that contributes to your cold start time. All right? Good question. The question is, where do you store your lambdas? And that comes back to one of the first questions we have. When you deploy lambdas, you put a zip together. And that zip will contain your lambda code, but it will also contain any dependencies that your lambda code needs. So for instance, if it's a Java application, I'm using uh, Apache Commons Lang. That's one of the jars that will be zipped up. And Lambda automatically include it in the class path when that Java Lambda runs. And the same holds true for all the other platforms, right? I'm just using that as an example. Does that answer the question? OK. Um, item potence. All right. Um, what that means is, depending upon what your initiating event is for your Lambda, it may be invoked with the same arguments more than once, which means that your lambdas need to be idempotent, right? So given the same inputs, they need to do the same thing no matter what. So for instance, if I wrote a lambda that incremented an account balance by a given number, that would be a problem, right? Because it's not idempotent. The first time it runs, I may increment that balance to 100. And the second time it runs, I may increment that balance to 150 or whatever, whatever the scenario is. Um, so you have to guard against that. If you can't make it item potent, um, it's not foolproof. But usually, I won't say, the overwhelming vast majority of the time, you will get unique event IDs for each set of invocations. And even if it's executed multiple times, that unique ID will get reused. If, let's say, you get executed twice, that unique ID that you get as part of your uh, context will basically um, will come along in the context the second time. And essentially, what you can do is you can look for that identifier, or if you have a natural identifier in terms of the parameters that the lambda has passed. And the concept is you keep track of what the lambda has processed. And if it's processed before, you exit out. All right? Now, that takes, that takes coding. 
Um, so the preference is to design your lambdas so that they're truly idempotent. All right, when to use lambdas. Um, suitable workloads for lambdas. Lambdas are good for workloads that take less than 15 minutes or can be broken up into other lambdas as needed, are stateless, um, are idempotent, that is, they can be executed with the same inputs and produce the same results. Um, one of the questions I commonly get asked is, should this be a lambda or should this um, not be a lambda? And I give them the, the workload speech as far as idempotence and statelessness and that kind of stuff. Um, but evidently, um, they also want to know about cost. So somebody out there wrote a nice little lambda cost calculator where you plug in the configuration options as far as allowed memory and allowed runtime and expect a number of executions and it'll give you a, a cost uh, estimate. All right? And it's a pretty detailed cost estimate. So you can get a... Uh, um, idea of what's cheaper. Um, typical examples, streaming data processors, kinesis handlers for all, um, anybody who uh, has to handle uh, stream data over kinesis. Uh, I've seen it used for replicating Dynamo database changes. Um, you can hook lambdas up to change events and if you need to replicate data to other systems, you can use lambdas to do that. Um, DevOps tasks. Um, complicated installs that you can't easily do in Terraform or CloudFormation, uh, security enforcement, uptime scheduling. Um, CloudFormation now has a macro facility where if you need to do something on an install that it doesn't support, you can invoke a Lambda. All right, and it'll do the CloudFormation will do that for you as a part of part of an install or update. One of my favorite uses for lambdas is herding the cats. One of the benefits of going to the cloud is basically speed the market, right? In other words, you free development teams to basically go out into the world and develop things without the need for as many uh, sysops people and without the need of people to lay wire and rack, uh, uh, rack hardware and all that. The problem is security. Right? I've gone into several clients where developers just put a database on the web, publicly accessible, because he couldn't figure out how to lock it down. And you know, all sorts of rookie mistakes along those lines. Where lambdas are really good is hurting the cats or spotting those kind of security breaches. True story, um, I'm debugging something that requires initiating an email and getting a response or something along those lines and our network configuration wasn't quite right. All right, so I temporarily, temporarily, wasn't gonna leave it this way, opened up a port to the world so that I could look at flow logs to see what needed to talk to what. And within a minute of me doing that, it got shut down. I got a nasty gram. I said, what the hell are you doing? You can't do this. And if you need to do this, you need to justify it through this process and outline what I needed to do. Um, that's perfect, right? They let the application team innovate within limits and they shut me down when I went too far. Um, there is another product out there called, uh, it's an open source product um, from Capital One, I, Cloud Custodian. Yep, that's it. Um, that does some of these things. So I'm not saying that you need to write lambdas for every security thing, um, security need that your enterprise has. But I'll bet you, I've seen a number of corporate environments. I've seen some really weird edicts come out from on high. I would bet you that you'll run into some edicts that. Um, the Capital One product or other uh, other tools won't do for you. And uh, that, lambdas are good for that. Now, the architect in me 
is has all sorts of warnings about lambdas about um, fender lock-in, all right? Because we have that thin interface that's AWS specific, and some um, some corporations don't like that. There are lambda alternatives. Increasingly, a lot of companies are getting into Kubernetes. There are some open source products, and I'm naming three of them down below, Fission, Native, and Kubeless, that basically um, will take a Docker service, virtualized, containerized service, and treat it like a Lambda. So in other words, you initiate a transaction to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes understands, because one of these three products is properly installed and configured, that that service is, is basically uh, to be instantiated, started, and basically um, Kubernetes or one of these three products will act as the man behind the curtain. So it will establish a ser uh, service while it's being used, shut it down on a given algorithm that's, for some of these products, is very configurable um, after it's done. Um, so I just point that out. As an architect, I always want to preserve options for the business. I'm not affiliated with Amazon. Uh, further reading, once again, linked to the slide deck. Um, one of my blogs, uh, I maintain a reading list of different articles I run into. Um, Amazon has a best practice list that they publish, um, that they publish at that URL. And I have been talking for quite a while. Um, there have to be questions. Yes, sir. Layers, okay. Um, the question I'm gonna infer about layers, given the one word you gave me, is when to use them? Yes. Okay. Um, layers is a more recent construct associated with Lambda where uh, the idea is between Lambdas you might have common functionality that you wanna share. All right, and so the idea there is you deploy that common, common functionality as a layer, and then when you deploy the lambda, you associate that lambda with the layer with the common functionality. And when it, when it comes down to execution time, it's just like you included the dependencies um, in the lambda itself, all right? Um, and that is initially appealing, and I haven't seen people go for it, and one of my issues I have with this, remember, best practices, minimizing support time, all that kind of stuff, um, there are hurdles with layers to being able to locally debug them, all right? If, I'm, if I've got a support problem, some reported defect that I've got to debug, and I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna debug it, yes, I can take those dependencies, add them to my path, however the, the platform language does it, and locally debug it. But what I'm locally debugging at that point isn't exactly what's running, right? As a support person, I wanna be debugging exactly what's running. I don't want any differences. And so there are hurdles as far as that goes, as far as with layers. And I always like to test all my deployments. So one of the touted advantage of layers is that if those dependencies change, I can publish a new version of that layer, tie all my existing layers to it, and let it go, right? Well, yes and maybe no. From a testing standpoint, that while I may have tested that layer change, testing the tight coupling and all its effect on all those lambdas in all the different situations that it might be in scares me a little bit. And I like to sleep at night. Not as much as most people do, but yeah, I like to sleep at night. So I haven't, I, I haven't bitten the apple yet and I haven't seen anybody else bite the apple yet for those reasons. Does that answer the question? Other questions? Yes, sir. Is there any reason you wouldn't use Lambdas for like a code rest LAPI? Thinking that's going to be IDE code and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be faster. 
Right. Um, you can use lambdas for quite a lot, all right? Um, and in fact, there is an educational site, and I'm not affiliated with these people either, and it's now a subsidiary of Amazon, so these guys are rich. Um, but a cloud.guru, they're an educational site. They started out, they've branched out into other cloud vendors now, but um, they, they offer a lot. Uh, AWS specific online courses. They claim to be, before they were bought by Amazon, by the way, they claim to be completely supported by, completely service, serverless, all right? So they're supported by Lambdas, supported by DynamoDB, and supported, um, they, don't use, they don't stand up instances at all, all right? Um, why wouldn't you use Lambdas? We talked about the, the lambda that took uh, several minutes to come up, right? Um, there are workloads that are not appropriate for lambdas that by their very nature need state and you don't want to deploy those as lambdas because lambdas want to be stateless, all right? So um, I'm not trying to tell you that everything should be a lambda. In fact, I'm pretty explicitly saying there are situations where you don't want to do that, all right? Um, but you'll have to, um, and part of that is designing your workload, right? Maybe if you pull apart a large workload, maybe some portions of it could be serverless and some maybe shouldn't be, right? I can't, I can't give you an edict that says, go do lambdas everywhere. Right. Well, the underlying assumption you're making is that that RESTful API is purely stateless. It's not relying on some sort of expiring cache mechanism or some sort of stateful mechanism that it's maintaining behind the scenes, right? Um, that's, that's, that's the part where I'm not, I'm not completely going down the path with you because I've seen RESTful APIs that are poorly designed that wouldn't work as lambdas. Okay? Yep. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, question is, um, recommendations as far as support for figuring out all the IAM policies that need to go with lambdas to make that make them work. Yes, no. Um, to my mind, I am policies for Lambda. The, I give the same advice for that as I give for IAM, IAM policies in general. Least, least uh, privileges, right? I hate seeing IAM, um, IAM uh, roles with like asterisks in it as far as like resources and as far as servers or services. I. I I don't know of any product that would, um, by default, um, tell you that. Um, having said that, I could see, and there's an open source product idea, people. Um, it would be easy enough to programmatically interrogate CloudTrail. In other words, install a Lambda, run it through some test cycles, and then inspect CloudTrail to see what services it actually invokes. And with that knowledge, you could then produce a very granular um, IAM role set for that Lambda. But I don't know of a product that does that. Does anybody else? <laughs> Um, 
fair, fair, fair enough. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, um, we are at time. I'm going to hang around for a little while. So if you think of questions, either come up to me after or my LinkedIn's up here. Give me a LinkedIn message or something. I'd be happy to address anything. Thanks for coming. Thank you.